Okay, so first of all, if anybody knows anything about CMM or CMMI, there's a few things that I'm going to challenge you with today. First and foremost, you probably need to forget and erase everything you've ever heard about it before. Um, there's, I'm currently working with the SEI to try to fix the problem that's been around for about 20 years and that the CMMI or predecessor to CMMI CMM has been abused, uh, it's been improperly implied, and there's been a lot of people going around saying they know what they're talking about because they're lead appraisers or they're instructors, but in fact they don't know how to fundamentally implement CMMI at its most basic level. And um, what I'm going to provide to you are the keys that make CMMI and Agile compatible, but these are also keys to helping anybody understand CMMI. And the reason, I believe in many respects, so many um, stories and, and, and a lot of press is out there, especially in blogosphere, about why CMM or CMMI uh, and Agile, or just about anything else for that matter, aren't compatible, have a lot to do with these incorrect applications of CMMI and an incorrect understanding of what it's about. So I'll provide you with these four keys to understanding what it is. Anybody that wants the presentation will be able to just let me know. I'll, I'll be glad to send it to you. Um, but the first thing to understand is CMMI is not a standard. Okay? That's the first thing. It is not a standard. You can't comply with CMMI. You can't um, follow CMMI and actually build any software. It is not meant for that. It is not a life cycle. It is not meant for developing actual ways of doing uh, product development. It is for improving them improving what it is that you're supposed to do. That's the key thing right here. I'm going to spend a lot of time focusing on what this thing means to be a model and how to use it. CMMI is a model. It is not a standard. It is not a life cycle. It is not something you can audit or be complied with. Um, understand what it means then to institutionalize, or another word for that is acculturate an organization with CMMI. And then finally, how to organize and what it is that the appraisal is about and what you can or don't have to do actually to get through an appraisal. So I think these four points hit upon the things that people have been uh, faced with, challenged with, in trying to implement CMMI and trying to appraise CMMI, whether or not they're agile, but in particular, the thing that I found most interesting is that my work with agile development, comp agile companies using agile development, is once they understand this, they run with it, and they could do a lot of things a lot faster than traditionally oriented organizations. Organizations with a lot of bureaucracy to begin with, with a lot of overhead to begin with, have a harder time understanding this and making it work for them because they sort of seem to be vested in this, uh, in, in, in the bureaucratic way of doing things, which can work under certain circumstances, but I don't recommend it anyway. Um, there's, a, once you do get the presentation, if you ask for it, there's two sections, actually this exercise is not in there, but there's a whole section that I'm skipping through. In fact, you're not even going to see the slides because um, I've hid them in the presentation. So we're going to focus on the main part, especially with only 30 or so minutes to go. Um, so first of all, let's get right into what it is and what it isn't. Uh, oh, by the way, I am, an, as, as Jochen said, I'm a, 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 scamp, a, high, a certified high maturity scamp elite appraiser, which um, is, means that I passed an oral exam that um, over 60% people fail the first time they try it. And so I can actually appraise to the highest levels of CMMI, which if you haven't passed the exam, you can't. And um, which all that is meant to give you provide context for the SCI really trusts what I say. Um, in fact, I'm co-authoring the first paper on CMMI and Agile with the SCI as we speak. Um, all right, so what it is and what it isn't. It's not a standard, not a prescription. Not a it is, however, a description, but it's something that cannot be cookie cutter and work every time, at least not well. Um, anybody that believes you have to purchase software or tools to do CMMI, you've been misled. Uh, there's a company in Northern Virginia who has been barred from becoming an SEI partner because they claim that their product will get you an SEI authorized appraisal result, an actual outcome. I really shouldn't say. I could, it, it's really easy to find. All you have to do is Google, you know, certi you know guarantee certified whatever, guaranteed appraisal, and you'll come up with it. Um, but uh, they, I've, had, I've had companies actually come to me and say, we were told by the same company that if they don't buy their software, they can't be appraised. 
Okay, so that just means that they were, being, again, misleading them. They won't appraise them if they won't buy their software, but that does not mean you can't be appraised without buying your software. All right, for, fundamentally, CMMI is about process improvement, not process compliance. It is, and again, I'll repeat this a number of times, it is not a development life cycle. Let me clarify for some folks what the difference between, I apologize, this is kind of skewed in that direction, and most of you are over here. <laughs> but um, it, to clarify what the distinction between a prescription and a description and what CMMI is being a description. For example, I like to use health as the uh, easiest one to prescribe or describe. Prescriptions sound like take twice daily before meals, that kind of thing. Um, or in my case, eat less than 1,800 calories a day, exercise 500 off a day, sleep at least eight hours at night, don't smoke, don't drink too much, don't eat refined carbs, and don't take your life or yourself too seriously. Um, those work for me. That's a prescription that I follow that may or may not work for a lot of other people. For some people, less than 1,800 calories a day, if they ate that much, would make them extremely unhealthy. And if they didn't eat as much as 18, they also extremely unhealthy. For me, it works, not everybody else. However, the description on this side is what, and this, by the way, would be like a procedure or an actually defined life cycle. Um, on the other hand, when you have just the description and it says, you know, well, you should see a doctor when you don't like how you feel, you're not sure what's wrong, you don't know what else to do. That's a description. It doesn't tell you when to see the doctor. It doesn't prescribe for you that if you feel on an intensity level of 1 to 10, you know, 8 or above, it's just completely descriptive. You have to fill in the blanks. What does it mean to take good care of yourself? What does it mean to eat right, get enough exercise, eat enough sleep, don't abuse your body and reduce stress? What does all that mean? The how to do it is not in this description. If you read through the CMMI, there's a, the required and the expected components are these. There's a whole laundry list of sub-practices, typical work products, and so forth that look like this. But again, if you had no idea what it meant to eat right, you might appreciate a few examples of what that means so that you can understand the model. That's all those descriptive, all the rest of that text is all about. It's to help you understand what the required and the expected components really mean. Another way to look at it is do, com process compliance means do it this way. Anybody familiar with government standards, mill standard, DOD standard 2167A, 2168, mill spec uh, the 498, any of those government standards, a lot of the FDA ones, a lot of the banking standards, Sarbanes-Oxley, though you can launch your list of other compliance frameworks, must be done a certain way. CMMI is not about that. It's about improving, and the way you, business, the way you determine whether or not something's improving is to tie it to your business and figure Figure out what are the things that are going to make a difference to your company or to your organization. That's what process improvement is about, classically, and what it's supposed to be about in CMMI. So the model is a simply, if you boil it down to something that almost everybody should understand, it's a business process. It's a model for business process improvement for the management of development processes. So that's where the tie-in to process improvement and software or other product development comes in. The current version, um, CMMI version 1.2, is actually called CMMI version 1.2 for either services or acquisition. There's two different versions of it. And in either case, what we're talking about, it's a model for business process improvement, not for the life cycle, but for the management of those practices. So if that's what the model is, then what it's not is it's not a life cycle for developing products for the standards of developing processes or develop, development processes, which is, again, I'm going to pound this in because this is the key, for, key uh, distinction to make all of this make sense. So I, the best thing I can do is probably spend the most time on this picture because these are all models. And as models, they share few but a number of significant commonalities. Um, starting at the far right or left, depending on which way you're looking at it. Um, on, over here on the left, there's a picture of a guy in, in black and white, and he's white buff. And so, but, you know, he's obviously used to try to convince people that this magazine will help you look like that. Um, but again, he's a model. There's uh, this aircraft over here is in a wind tunnel. It's kind of hard to see with the lighting situation, but he's a, this aircraft is in a wind tunnel. It's either a, a Boeing 717 or an MD-80 type aircraft with its flaps down and its landing gear down, and most people would know. If they know what they're looking at, would say this is in a landing configuration, and they're probably trying to judge the uh, airflow over the air, over the wing and into the engine and trying to figure out what the best way to um, manage that. But, you know, and again, it's just a model, and no people are going to fly on this plane, and there's no luggage in it, and there's probably nothing else in it 
to you know the, the hull, and it's probably about that big. Um, again, here's another airport, and again, this one does not show you a lot of detail, but it does show you that you can actually put a 747 and a 757 next to each other at the same terminal and kind of go around the bend here, and you see all these different aircraft, and it gives you a sense of, oh, over here you've got the international arrivals and departures, and over here you've got the commuter aircraft, and gee, wouldn't it be nice if we could do that and we'd have a lot more throughput at our airport, and so maybe they're going to use this to sell the idea to the local transportation authority. This building, again, is not real. It is a picture of it, or is a model of a building either used to sell the developer on the idea, sell the financer, or to sell space to people once they are trying to convince people, you know, you want to lease space in our beautiful building. Look at that atrium. Wouldn't that be wonderful to work there? But there are pretty much, there's no escape routes, there's no elevators, there's no bathrooms in the building. Um, it's just a model, but certainly they're going to use it. Now, had anybody not recognize what that is? Okay, everybody's laughing. So you all recognize what that is, okay? It's the one, two, three, enterprise, right, okay. Now, can you, for those of you that are definitely in front, you should be able to see what the main enterprise is made out of. Lego. Lego. Okay. Can you, if you really, if you got up close to it, you'd be able to actually tell that it's not just Lego. Uh, actually, at this resolution, it probably looks more like what it is. At a higher resolution, it's harder to tell. It's a Lego, but it's not quite Lego either, is it? What is it? It's a computer rendering of a Lego model of the enterprise. Okay. So the one thing that these five images have in common is that they are not real. They don't represent reality, they, you know, they are a, a version of reality, but they're still, they're not for real. They are just models. And the point that they are there to represent is they all serve a purpose. They serve a purpose to help people put their mind on a certain path and going down in a certain direction so that you can then do something with that. So get yourself thinking in the right direction, and then you may be able to be productive, so we provide this model. It would be a lot harder to test the airflow over this wing if we tried only to do it on a real plane. It would be expensive and risky and not yield the same kind of data. Um, granted, after they figured all this stuff out, they do put it on a real plane, and they do fly, and they do test it, but not before they've done all this. Same goes for every one of these other models. This guy was vetted because he looks like a surfer guy, so they put him in front of a the beach, they gave him a surfboard, which is kind of hard to see, and they, you know, they use that. But the Enterprise is where I really like to talk about because no one doesn't recognize it as the Enterprise, yet it's made out of Lego. So the fact that it is not the Enterprise didn't stop anyone from recognizing that it's a model of the Enterprise. The fact that it's made out of Lego didn't stop anyone from saying, well, but it, you know, it's not really the Enterprise. Everybody said it's the Enterprise. And the fact that it's a computer rendering of a Lego model of a ship that's not going to be built for 400 years didn't stop anybody from recognizing that it is a model of the Enterprise. So if all of you were made into lead appraisers for whether or not someone understood the Enterprise and went and built something, you'd pass this person for having successfully implemented a model of the Enterprise. Okay. Now, stepping back to CMMI, how many different versions of enterprise model could someone have come up with if you handed them the enterprise CMM or the enterprise CMMI? They could come up with a bazillion different versions. They didn't have to make it this color. They didn't have to choose the NCC 1701B. They could have chosen something else. They could have chosen a lot of different ways. They didn't have to make it out of Lego. And furthermore, they didn't have to render it in computers before they tried to make it out of Lego. They could have done a lot of things. In fact, they go for Paramount. They do a lot of those things, and they come up with a bunch of different enterprises, class aircraft, spacecraft. And so the point being is that the model is successfully applied by looking at the evidence. Here's the evidence of a Lego model of the enterprise. Does that meet model requirements for enterprise? Yes. In CMMI, it's the exact same thing. The difference being that if people don't know how to look at the model, or and more importantly, they don't know how to look at the evidence, and then extrapolate from that evidence, did they apply the right model to get this evidence, they're going to fail whatever it is that they're looking at. If they can't do the abstraction from, here's a model in abstract, here's the evidence, and compare the evidence to the model, they will fail. And if you're an appraiser, an appraisal team, and you can't make that extrapolation yourself, you'll probably fail them. Because why? Because you don't have this specific prescription that we're all in the examples. Because you don't know any better. You're looking for this exact prescription, or you're going to fail the person or the organization. So if there's, two, there's a two-way equation here with the, uh, with, the, with the model. 
If you can't take a model that is an abstraction and apply it to a specific situation so that you are improving that specific situation, then you will not successfully implement CMMI, or at least not without pain. And if they're the appraisal team and you don't understand the context of the organization, you don't understand what they're up to, you don't understand the technology, you don't understand their business operations, and you're trying to appraise them and you can't abstract from a model to reality, again, it's going to be a painful situation. That's the key. That's the number two thing. It's a model. That's how models work. If you're not familiar with how to use models, if you don't have that background, and a lot of background you know, architects and engineers have that background, yeah. I would That's interesting that you use that number, because when I was at a conference of nothing but appraisers and instructors, I came up with the same answer, 10%. So here's a room full of authorized instructors and appraisers, and about 10% of them could do that. Scary, but true. So all it is is a matter of buyer beware when you're going out to do CMMI or CR or any kind of work with process improvement models, because the... Um, there aren't that many people. I'll, I, afterwards, if when during the last half hour of networking, I'll tell you my theory on how people end up as lead appraisers, at least 90% of them um, end up as lead appraisers, and the rest of the other 10% end up, you know. Um, and I had, I, I've talked to the SCI about this, and they're probably, they're mostly in agreement, and we're trying to bust our heads to figure out how do we undo the mistake they made. Um, but we're working on that. All right, so I'm not, I, can't, I don't have a lot of time. I really need to spend a lot of time on this because that's the one thing if you take nothing away from this. By the way, there will be a quiz, and I'm giving away stuff for right answers. Um, take nothing away from the whole talk today is to understand how to do this model stuff, that it is about models. Normally, an organization that builds software that has happy clients, happy people, happy everything, making money, normally when they come in, they're already doing a lot of things that get them what they need out of CMMI. They already know how to improve it. Whether they're exploiting those activities for improvements is another question, but the actual grunt work of what they need to be doing, they are already doing. We come in with the CMMI and hopefully we find this large overlap. What people have this perception of CMMI is that CMMI is actually like the Death Star and, and their operation is more like Alderaan and they're gonna, gonna get blown away. <laughs> You know, and, and that's really kind of how they think about what's going to happen when they implement CMMI, but the vast majority of implementations, if they are a decent shop, I'm assuming, you know, they're not a bunch of schlocks because, you know, that's a lot of companies out there too, that they actually don't need to do a lot of work to get CMMI in place. Um, just like, I mean, I'm sure a lot of organizations have a bit, would have a harder time transitioning from whatever they're doing to Agile as than they would from whatever they're doing to CMMI, assuming that they're already a decent shop. Just the, the paradigms are, are already in place. So what's required in the model? Here is another place where people get really caught up in the wrong concepts. Goals are required. Everything else is commentary. Everything in the model that's not a goal is there to help you understand what the goals are all about. And you must be able to demonstrate that you are achieving the goals. The, um, so if you didn't have any other way of achieving the goal and you were completely clueless and you've read through the model, they've got these practices throughout the model. The goals are all made up of various practices. If you don't have any better way of doing it, follow the practices at least to get started and then maybe come up with your own ideas. But the practices are only expected, they're not required, the goals are required. So if you, you know, you can't just say we achieve a goal and have nothing to show for it, no process, no result, no proof in the pudding, none of that, you just, we do it. No, that's not gonna work for improvement. The whole point is improving. You can't improve what you don't know what you're doing. So you have to have something that you know what you're doing to be able to achieve a goal. If you don't have your own stuff, try the practices first. Again, it's really, everything is really commentary to help you understand what the goals are all about. The people get tripped up often when they assume that when CMMI says requirement specification, not that it says that, that it means requirement specification the way the DOD means it or Department of Defense, whatever, yeah. yeah. I, I heard you say something, I just want to make sure I heard it correctly. Um, in the case where the newest software is being implemented, there's some practice that they're doing, but it's not formalized. Okay. It depends on what the practice is and depends on what your goals are. If your goal is to improve it, 
and it's not formalized, then there's like standing on mud. There's nothing to go, you can't, there's no foothold, there's no way to actually make the progress you want until you kind of get a stronger foothold. If the practice is not essential to your business development, your product development, or any other aspect of your business, and you're not trying to improve it, then why formalize it? But there are certain things that you don't, you know, that you don't want to not be formal if it's your purpose to improve them. So if you're trying, if you don't care about, um, you know, how your estimates work. If you don't care that your estimates are off by more than 20% at the end of every project, and that's not important to you to tighten up, then your estimation process could certainly be informal. Now, CMMI says you should care about your estimate process. Your estimate process is critical to a lot of other things that you do. You want to have some way of knowing that one, one estimate to the next, you're following something, some logic, at least a logical pattern as opposed to anti-patterns toward achieving, you know, reliable estimates. So that's the, you know, but if you're not doing certain things and they're not critical to your business, CMMI doesn't care. Okay, it doesn't care whether, and that's another thing, it doesn't care whether you're using Agile or any other development method. Um, so the, the, the thing also is that just because CMMI uses a certain word or a certain phrase does not mean that that's, in your mind, understanding, it's the only way to define it. It's a, very, a lot of room for interpretation. There are 22 different process areas. Those process areas are collections of stuff that might happen at any point in your organization at any time that, you know, over whatever life cycle. Just pass these around. And there should be extras to make it to the back of the room. And here are three for you guys. Um, and those 22 process areas are listed on that card, and um, they're listed twice. Now, we're not going to get into a lot of detail, mostly due to the, for time purposes, but the, the point is that there are 22 areas that are not sequential, they're not serial, they're not collectively, you know, exa mutually exclusive or collectively exhaustive. They are stuff that happens anywhere in your organization to achieve the product's development. So what's important to understand is that process areas, those 22 that are on that card, they're not processes or process procedures. They're not process descriptions. They don't represent a standard. They don't represent any kind of forms or formatting. And if basically, they're not the last word in what processes you guys need to be doing if you want to be improving your processes. They're simply what you are to do to improve what you're doing, not to define what you're doing. Um, yeah. Okay. Requirements management. There you go. It's the first one most people start it. You got to document. Doc what? Document what? Requirements. No, you don't. Okay. Yeah. Requirements management. Requirements management simply says in 20 words or less, well, maybe 80 words or less, know what the requirements are that your customer is expecting you to know to commit to. to, commit to. Know what they are. No, get commitment from the organization to actually do those requirements from your own organization. Have a way of knowing when the requirements change. Have a way of knowing when the requirements are actually in the product and not in the product. And know when and how to fix it when you don't. What about requirements? Requirements development. Requirements development says have a way to come up with this mutual understanding between you and your customer on what the product needs to do, what they want it to do, the environment it needs to work in. It basically says how come up with you as the organization doing development need to figure yourselves out for what it is that you're going to build before you go and build it. And, come, and how the product requirement from a high level, users included, however you want to define it, ends up in the product. So that you build the right thing and that it works where it's supposed to work. Okay, it doesn't say you need a spec. It doesn't say you need a requirements traceability matrix. It doesn't say that you need to have use cases with the following information in it. It just says know how to do all that stuff and know how you want to do it so that if it breaks, you know how to fix it and tell other people don't make the same mistake, stupid. You know, that's what it's for. It doesn't tell you to have any more depth, volume, or any of that. The same thing I look for as artifacts anywhere else. This is how they do it. Where does it show up that they did it that way? In the product, 
in the whatever they call documentation? Does it show up on the board? Does it show up on sticky notes? Does it show up in index cards? Does it show up in PDFs and JPEGs? Where does it show up that they're actually methodically going through and getting from point A to point B when the product's at the end and it does what the customer wants, when the customer wants it, or how much they paid for it? That's all we look for. That's what you're supposed to look for. Looking for anything else makes the appraiser's job easy. They still have to have artifacts, but that doesn't equal documentation. But artifacts and documentation are not synonymous. That's actually a couple of slides from now. It says exactly that. Um, yeah. Then I'd have to ask them, how is it that they're going to use the sticky notes to improve the next time? See, they have to want to improve. If they don't want to improve, then they're not generally going to have a lot of evidence lying around. If they don't want to improve and every project is going to be reinventing the wheel, then great. They're not doing process improvement. We're not going to fake their way to be doing process improvement. But they actually want the next time they do this to be better than the last time. Yeah. A few slides back, you said prescriptive, descriptive. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, you want to see the method they're going through as a, as a process. What if the process itself is changing in the national process? Great. Is that, is that okay? Why not? Yeah, I mean, at the project level, you'd hope the process would change from project to project. At the organ within, the pro within the project, actually, you start with something in requirements engineering. Right. And while you go over the project, you realize that approach wasn't working. So? so the project adapts to the situation. Good. That is not in conflict with CMS. There's nothing in there that says you shouldn't do that. Okay. There's nothing in there that says use the wrong process, <laughs> which is effectively what you'd be doing. You know. Right, it's not prescriptive. It's like your organization needs to change every iteration or every sprint, every whatever, change. Go ahead. I mean, just know why you changed and what you're changing from and to, which you should. At some point, you said, this doesn't work. It sucks. Let's do something better. What's that something better? Let's all agree. Great. We agree. Go. Do it. So um, I appreciate the questions, but in 30 minutes, there's a lot we can talk about. Um, here's the thing about institutionalization. This is the key. Process and project and product. All you need to understand about process institutionalization or acculturation is if you look on the car, side of the card that has the CMMI logo and the little stamp that I stuck on it, um, on the bottom there's a list of uh, 10 things or 11 things on the left and a few more things on the right, another six things, about 16, 17 different generic practices. If you read through the left-hand side of those generic practices, fundamentally what they're saying is treat your processes as you treat products and projects. Know what they are, know what the process is, have a plan of some sort for doing it, meaning know who's going to do it, know what resources they're going to use, know when they're going to do it. You know, if they don't know how to do it, train them. If they produce products that need to be controlled, just like code, control it. People that need to have their input, their stakeholders, in other words, get the stakeholders involved. Monitor that you're actually doing the process, just like you'd be monitoring your products. Make sure that if you're doing some sort of verification, some sort of peer review, you want to be doing them on your process as well, just like Johan was saying. You want to basically have your... Uh, you know, make sure that the process works for your project. And finally, if there's a problem, let, the, let, your, let, let managers, let some leadership, let somebody know that it's not working and that they can do something about it. That's what you do with the project. That's what acculturating your organization to doing processes is about. Um, many people have, who have some knowledge of capability versus maturity or stage versus continuous will ask this question. So in a heartbeat, I'll basically say, staged representation ends up in maturity levels, and it simply says these are the requirements, these are the, as I read the word requirements, these are the process areas that you um, lump together to get the various maturity levels. Um, and your institutionalization, it grows by maturity, meaning the more things you know how to do. And if you're looking at continuous, your institutionalization grows by capability means that you can take a given process area and just be more capable at doing it, which um, gets you further and further up this scale. Um, and those are simply taking the same process areas, these, and mixing and matching until they meet your needs. So those are two different representations. Version 1.3 or 2.0 or whatever the next version may actually completely get rid of both of these and call it something else. We'll see. We're not sure yet. 
Um, so how do you set up an agile CMMI? How to make CMMI actually agile? Obviously, understanding the four points that we had earlier. Keep in mind that there are three kinds of objective evidence that you need some direct and either indirect or affirmation, details we can't get into. That objective evidence does not equal documentation. And that proof in the pudding is a good thing. Problem with proof in the pudding is that you end up requiring some appraisal and appraiser team, appraiser and appraisal team, to actually know what your context is. You can't just hire a whole bunch of outsiders that have never done software development and expect to actually have them understand what you do. Um, there's a certain assumption that makes the approach work. It means that, you know, assuming I've said a lot of this already, you already are successful, you know what you need to be doing, you're probably doing something right because you're still in business. And the way I tell companies, if you don't understand the practices in the model, have someone, if you yourselves can't, translate all the practices into a risk that it avoids. Figure out what you're successful at risk or doing to avoid those risks, map them back to the model because every practice avoids a risk. If you can understand the risk that the practice avoids, then you can map them back to the model and you shouldn't have any trouble. If there are gaps between what's in the model and the risks you're avoiding, that means you're by definition assuming some kind of risk that you probably in the future might not want to continue assuming and it's probably a good idea to do those things to avoid those risks. That's where you can improve and actually do things you might not have been doing before to improve your processes. Um, there's a, an approach that we take that I can't describe here in detail. The idea is figure out what your various life cycles are at the business development, at the project management, at the daily management level. Those are where your actual activities are going to be happening. Map them back to the CMMI process areas. And once you get the slides, if you care to read more on it, you could read more about how we then break things out. The critical thing to understand is once you have done this kind of mapping, then what we end up doing is we look for the evidence in your actual work. All these are just six of the 22 process areas. Um, but where that should show up should show up in your actual work, not in anything you did specifically to get through an appraisal. Um, the rest of the slides talk about what we did to do it actually in scrum organizations. Um, the key here is to understand technology, the processes and practices of the organization, the culture, their project types and style, and who the customers are. In other words, understand the context, or this can all fall apart. Um, and like I said, the very end of this presentation, once you get your hands on it, we'll show you how we did this in a Scrum organization and which process areas and practices they map to uh, using Scrum. And that would be it. So I have time for questions later, but go ahead. Yeah. Is that of interest for anybody else in the room? Because we have another, we have another 30 minutes slot. I just want to, I just want to see if, if you guys can hear you know, after, after sure. the session. Um, I just also want to point out that Hilal uh, is getting uh, from Washington actually this morning, so he's not in New York, the local resource you can just tap every day. So um, he will stick around uh, after 10 o'clock for a little longer, and he will be also in, in town. So just you know, set up a meeting with him and. Uh, uh, even afterwards. Uh, yeah. Thanks. And I've got um, two CMMI posters that have the entire model on a poster and four decks, uh, four sets, I should say, of planning poker cards. So if you want planning poker cards, there's six sets. You have six developers at the same time working on them. Um, let me know and answer some quiz questions, and I'll you know, okay. give them out. So. Okay. Thank you. Sure.